real estate investors sometimes have trouble finding a financial planner who can incorporate their real estate holdings into their financial plan. And here to talk with me about this is Dana Ansbach from Sensible Money. Dana, welcome. Thanks, Bob. Great to be here. Great to have you here. It's a question that uh, troubles the world of real estate investors. How can they go about finding a planner who can help them with their holdings? Um, Tell us more about that. Yeah, you know, it's a question that has troubled me at times too. And so to explain why it can be troubling, let me tell you about a situation with a friend of mine. I will call her Andrea. And over a decade ago, Andrea and her husband, David, decided that he would be the primary wage earner and her role in the family was going to be to build up their wealth through real estate. Now, fast forward 10 years later, they have a net worth of nearly $10 million. Over 5 million of that is in various real estate holdings, including 22 rental properties. And their goal is to build up enough passive income for David ultimately to leave his W-2 job. About every two to three years, they hire a financial planner because they believe in planning. And Andrea tells me that almost every time the planner comes back with a recommendation at the end that says, and now sell all your real estate holdings and invest the proceeds with us in traditional stock bond and mutual fund investments. So she said she always gains some insights through the planning process, which she finds valuable, but she finds the recommendations at the end a little bit ridiculous. And I agree, it's troubling. By using leverage and all of the tax advantages available to real estate investors, she has been able to accumulate far more wealth than she would have been able to have accomplished just investing in the stock market. So it seems odd for a professional to just say, yeah, this has worked great for you. Now sell it all and and put it over here. So I feel like something must be missing in the way that many financial planners view real estate. So this year, Andrea and I agreed to do a project on trade. I said, I will run your production model, which our our model that we use focuses on how to create reliable cash flow in retirement. And in return, she would help us improve our modeling process so it can incorporate real estate investments just as seamlessly as it incorporates stock and bond investments. Yeah. So why is it so important to incorporate the real estate holdings into the plan? Well, it's important because you want to get a big picture view of everything. And I think what makes it so hard is that most financial planners use off-the-shelf software, and it has inputs for very common things like IRAs, 401ks, traditional brokerage accounts, and those accounts typically own pretty traditional investments, publicly traded investments like stock, bonds, and mutual funds. And in addition, um, you can usually put in some risk factors. So if you want to run like a Monte Carlo analysis on the variability of returns, you can do that in the software. But it doesn't have those same factors that can apply to real estate holdings. You also have all of the tax rules. Those are pretty straightforward when it comes to a 401k account, for example. You deduct it when you put it in. It's taxable when you take it out. You have interest, dividends, and capital gains. So the software packages do a great job of handling these, what I'll call basic account and investment types. When you get into real estate holdings, everything changes. Now you have appreciation on the property itself, which is similar to an assumed growth rate on an investment account, but you also have the cash flow that comes in from the property and the tax impact. And many real estate holdings are cash flow positive, but they're tax negative or tax neutral. And it's not very easy to model that out using traditional financial planning software. Hmm. So tell me more about how that works then. So let me use a a rental, a residential rental uh, real estate holding as an example. You have your expenses, property taxes, insurance, maintenance and repairs, marketing and leasing costs, and so on. Let's say those add up to about $6,500 a year with no major repairs that year. Then you have rent coming in. Let's say you've got $12,000 a year of rent. So your property generates positive cash flow of $5,500 a year. But on a tax return, you also get to claim depreciation as an expense. So if you purchase the property for $300,000 to use depreciation, you have to separate out the land value from the building value. Let's say the building value was about two fifty. dollars You divide that by 27.5. That's what the IRS designates as the useful life of the property. And you get about $9,000. i am rounding down about $9,000 of depreciation. So 
when you add that to your $6,500 of expenses, uh, you now have $15,500 of deductions and $12,000 of rental income. So you have a $3,500 loss. We describe this as cash flow positive, but tax negative, or I say in, in many cases tax neutral, because the ability to actually use that tax loss on your tax return depends on your classification. It means that not everyone can deduct those losses and the rules get, get pretty complicated actually. Right, so um, uh, a summary of uh, may or may not be able to use those losses? Well, so let's say you have less than $100,000 of adjusted gross income, then you can deduct up to $25,000 of losses. As soon as your income gets in that hundred to $150,000 phase, that deduction begins to phase out. For those with AGIs, adjusted gross income over 150, if you're married, in order to use the losses, you have to qualify one or the other of you, or if you're single, just yourself, as what's called a real estate professional. And there is a whole set of qualifications that you have to meet but based on how many hours you spend and you actually need a log of those hours to achieve real estate professional status. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a, a realtor license, for example. There's other ways to qualify. So for everyone with higher income that is classified as a real estate professional, you can deduct those losses against ordinary income. But for everyone else, and there's a lot of high income earning real estate investors who aren't classified as real estate professionals, then the losses are what are called passive losses. So you can only deduct them against other forms of passive income. And those losses will accumulate. And in general, they get used when the property is sold. You can't use passive losses against, for example, W-2 income. You can't use them against investment income, interest, dividend, and, and, and regular capital gains, for example. However, the loss does get used to offset gains when you sell the property. And even if you're not a real estate professional, along the way, because of the depreciation, if you have positive cash flow coming in from the property, $5,500 a year in our example, you've still gotten essentially tax-free cash flow along the way. You also have the potential of what I call tax arbitrage. So that depreciation accumulates. And when you sell the property, uh, you recapture the depreciation. It's taxed at a 25% rate. So if you are in the 40% rate uh, tax rate along the way, now you're paying tax at a 25% rate. That's a pretty good tax savings there. I'll say 15% all day long. So, um, it, so what can financial planners do to better incorporate these real estate investments into, um, into their projections? Yeah, so from what I see, most real estate investors track their property data like a snapshot, like a still moment in time. They keep records about their current value, their cap rate, the cash flow. What financial planners do really well is they take a net worth snapshot and they turn it into a movie. And that movie shows how things are likely to play out over time. So for rental real estate, you need to project the net cash flows after expenses. If the real estate's leveraged, you need an amortization schedule, and it should include what those cash flows would look like, for example, when the note is paid off. The projection should also include periodic upkeep expenses. Then you also have to project how those cash flows impact the tax return, and those aren't exactly the same things. There's a great book I'd recommend for both financial planners and anyone interested in real estate investing alike. It's called The Book on Advanced Tax Strategies, Cracking the Code for Savvy Real Estate Investors. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, the authors are CPAs, Amanda Hahn and Matthew McFarland are their names. So that's a really useful tool for, for financial planners. You also have to be able to look at how the real estate is going to affect the net worth statement over time. And you have to have some type of year by year sale analysis. So, you know, if they were to sell the property, how is that going to impact their cash flow and their tax return? And that includes having a way to account for depreciation recapture and, and passive loss carry forward. So it's a lot to incorporate. And since most of the tools that the common tools that planners use don't include this functionality, it, it can definitely be challenging. Right. So what else have you learned from your trade with Andrea? 
So Andrea and I have had some great conversations about risk and risk management. So for example, Andrea owned four properties in Texas. When that freeze hit uh, in, in February of 2021, she had frozen pipes in all four properties, four insurance claims all at once and four tenants out all at once. She had never factored in something like that happening all at the same time. So we've all heard the saying that real estate takes deep pockets. Here's the primary difference. In, instead of being cash flow positive for 2021, she was obviously cash flow negative. She had to come out of pocket. That is a key difference between investing in the stock market, right? We're never forced to have what's called a capital call. We never have to put money back in. Although maybe when the market is down, we should, <laughs> but we don't have to. With real estate, when damage happens, when these situations happen, you have to have cash or access to liquidity in some way to get everything back up and running. So there's a higher risk level there. Now, my focus and, and my firm's focus is on creating reliable and predictable cash flow. So I asked Andrea, you know, how do real estate investors typically manage that type of risk? Well, one way is through an emergency fund that's set for each property. So we're all, as financial planners, you know, familiar with the concept of emergency funds. Now you would have one for each property. Another way is some real estate investors only spend their cash one year in arrears. So whatever net cash flow came in last year, that is their budgetable amount for the current year. Now for me, that's a little challenging because the income can vary so much depending on the expenses. I wouldn't really want to be retired and have my income get cut in half one year. It's, it's a little hard to budget on that. And so another option that many real estate investors do is they will build up their portfolio until it generates almost two times the cash flow that they want. And then they have the ability to weather a year where it gets cut in half. In general, all of these are very similar strategies that are used when we build income off a of stock and bond portfolio. Sometimes financial planners recommend a bucket strategy where you keep a year's worth of living expenses in cash. And so that's how you would weather a market downturn. Overall, the, the concepts are very similar, whether you're applying them to financial planning, traditional investments, or, or whether you're applying them to real estate. The one thing that I know kept coming to my mind is there is no free lunch. Mm -hmm. So Andrea and I got, got a good laugh when I see all the work she does and, and people call it passive income. I'm like, I don't see anything <laughs> passive about this. Yeah. That's a misnomer for sure. Yeah, <laughs> it sure is. And she agreed. She says, no, this is not passive. Um, real estate investments, I can certainly see in her case, have offered her the opportunity to earn returns far higher than what she could have gotten in the stock market, but the level of risk is also higher. There really isn't any free lunch. She's had to come up with cash out of pocket at times. I also had another friend who had leveraged up and, and bought many rental properties and she had to short sell them all in the 2008, 2009 situation. So you never know, the risk is there, a natural disaster could hit all of your properties. So there is no free lunch, that, that's pretty apparent. The other thing that came up in my conversations with Andrea was just some of the factors people forget. So tenant duration is an item she brought up. A lot of people, especially new real estate investors, will look at a property and run everything out with the rosiest set of projections. If you have a, a, a property where the tenant turns over a lot, that increases your costs. How much time, how, what your vacancy rate is, how much time do you typically have between tenants? What's your turnover cost? So people forget to factor in the impact of these things. And perhaps their initial projections are a little too optimistic. So that's definitely something to watch out for. Yeah. So I do want to ask you about your ability to incorporate real estate into a financial plan. But, but first, um, Dana, two questions. One is, um, in, my, in doing my research in preparation for our talk today, two things came up. One is the uh, planner's ability to charge for services related to incorporating real estate holdings and also incorporating real estate holdings in a way that takes into account either their correlation or lack thereof with the investment portfolio? Yeah, those are great questions. So, you know, some planners charge a flat fee to do a financial plan. Uh, all of our clients come in paying a, a set fee for the financial plan. And sometimes that fee can change depending on the complexity. So in that case, you should be able to, in, to, to incorporate real estate holdings. Um, when you have planners that only charge based on, for example, assets under management and 
charging based on the, the net worth value of that real estate probably isn't feasible. That can be a challenge. So, you know, paying attention to the way people charge and if their model uh, allows them to incorporate these types of investments can, can definitely be a factor. And the other certainly is correlation, although you know, I would say in 2008, 2009, we kind of saw everything highly correlated, both real estate and, and stocks and bonds. But definitely there can be a value to having different sources of cash flow coming in. But there's also work involved. Some people don't want the work involved in real estate, or it may be a great tool while they're in the accumulation phase. But as they get to that retirement age, they think, well, you know, this is a lot of work and, and it's more hands-on than I want to be. And that's when there may need to be a very thoughtful transition plan about how to reduce the workload or, or exit out of some of those real estate holdings and make it just easier, a little, a little more manageable for them. Yeah. The, the other two things that popped up was the notion of how educated planners need to be about real estate investing in order to accommodate it in their practice. And also the regulatory environment that they um, operate under and the degree to which it, there is something, a regulatory body that oversees one with respect to real estate. Yeah, I think both of those are factors. And keep in mind, as a planner, we're not giving advice on the real estate in terms of its investment viability, but it's really how do I include that in the overall projection that, I, that I'm showing to you? How do I educate you about the risks? How do I incorporate the tax consequences? Maybe it would be better to sell the property one year versus another year. Maybe when passive losses are released, that gives me the opportunity to do a big Roth conversion that year. So as planners, for us, it's less about making a, a recommendation like, yes, you should invest in real estate, or yes, that's a good property. Um, that's not a level I would go to, but it's more about, you're already good at this, if you're a real estate investor, how do I help you see the big picture and, and put all of this together? Yeah. So I think I already know the answer to this, but I'll ask anyway about um, how you feel about your ability to incorporate uh, real estate into financial plans now that you've worked with Andrea. Yeah. So I feel like we did a fair job of it already. Uh, I say fair because it wasn't great, but it was better than how I'd seen lots of people incorporate it. Now I am super jazzed about what we can do. So working with an expert, she knows her stuff, having her input on how we include things and, and how we model it out. It's really been awesome to have someone like that as, as part of this project. Mm -hmm. I will say it is still far more time consuming to build financial plans that have real estate in them. There's just more factors to incorporate, but now we can better see how all of those factors interact with one another. And I think, you know, it allows us to give better advice. And of course, ultimately, our goal is always, how do we help people see how they're going to get reliable, predictable cash flow throughout their retirement years? Yeah. So we've covered a lot of ground. Anything that we missed or anything that just bears uh, reemphasizing? You know, the only thing I would reemphasize is that there's a lot of different ways to get to an end game. So, um, you know, we all need to be open minded that it, maybe our expertise is in stocks and bonds, but it isn't the only way to get to a, a certain end goal. And as planners, we really want to be unbiased and, and step back and have the ability to look at the big picture. Uh -huh.